Hello everyone and welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Whitney Kahinde. I'm Ellie. Hi and I'm Hannah. We are the founders of Cambridge Creatives which is a student-run creative collective. We're curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them on the Q&A function, which is somewhere down there, and not the chat, chat function, and we'll read them out for you. One, bear with us if there are any technical difficulties, and two, let us know in the chat if there are any problems hearing or seeing us. And most importantly, enjoy the Q&A. So just as a brief introduction for our guest today, uh, Whitney Kahinde is an acclaimed stage actor. She trained at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. Recently, she played Viola in Twelfth Night and Cornelia in Hamlet. She has recently been in Ar Ariel and the Tempest and appeared in a new series of Pennyworth. We are honoured to have this impressive actress speak. So my first question for you, Whitney, is when did you know that you wanted to be an actor? Um, I kind of didn't <laughs> until I was probably about 18, to be honest. Um, I, I did the whole Saturday school thing that most actors do, like come out of your shell, your parents put you in stagecoach. Um, I liked singing, I liked musical theatre, um, but I didn't know that I wanted it to be my profession until I kind of did my musical theatre exams and everyone in my school on the performing arts course sort of auditioned for drama school and I like happened to get in. So I, I just went along with it and um, no, I never had aspirations since I was a child. I just always liked it and um, was lucky and took it, the opportunity. Yeah, amazing. Um, when you were part of the National Youth Theatre and studying at Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, um, did you feel like that was really beneficial to your career? Like, would you recommend going to drama school or film school? Or do you think that it would also be accessible to learn by doing? Um, I don't know. That question, like, you often get asked that as an actor, but it's really subjective, like, mm -hmm. with who you are, um, whether you've got access to student loans, obviously that all comes in. Um, if you've already done a degree, if you can afford to go and train for a short course and everything. But personally, I, I would say it's really useful to train. Um, it's kind of like this place that you're allowed to fail. You're allowed to make mistakes um, with your peers. You learn skills, you learn stage combat, you learn ballet, the basics of it. Um, accents, phonetics, things I still use in my career today um, that I may not have had access to if I didn't come like agents and everything mm. um so personally I, I I would say it's useful to go to drama school I would say go if you can but also it's not essential you you learn on the job every job you get um so I think it, you know whether you want to go and whether you don't so yeah perfect thank you yeah um and how did you kind of get into the industry what was your sort of career path um out of drama school so I, I think I had, I, I don't know, it is kind of like an unusual path in terms of like understudying and then going to do the bigger parts. Like I think that's more of like an old fashioned way of getting it. I think now when people graduate, they're more likely to get an episode of Doctors on the BBC. But um, yeah, I understudied um, Twelfth Night at the National and that was sort of my first job. It was a great job. I learned a lot. You know, there was someone else from my year as well in the ensemble and understudying. So that felt really confident that I at least knew one person on the first day. So, yeah, that was my sort of way in. That was my first gig. And then after that, how did that sort of transition into future? Um... Well, um, the director actually that did Twelfth Night at the National, that was also the person that gave me my second job, which was also to... Um, have uh, the part of Cornelia and understudy Ophelia at the um, Hamlet and King Lear um, tour of the US and UK so that sort of knowing the director from first job was my second job as well. Oh amazing mm. and do you have any advice for students who would want to follow in your footsteps? Oh, I don't know uh, do, you, do you mean people that are auditioning to go to drama school or people that are in drama school? Uh, probably people who are at sort of our university level so not yet at drama school okay consider. right I, I would say like watch plays keep interested have something to talk about so if you do want to go and audition you know you have that there um try everything except you know every opportunity that you get whether it's a short film that you're doing at uni or if, if it's a play like audition and try and do it find the love for it and 
don't get like disheartened if things don't go a certain way because that could be your way going somewhere else on a different path and you know keep going if you if you know that this is what you want to do really mm. yeah that's great advice thank you mm. um specifically for applying to bristol old vic or just drama school in general mm. what was the application process like and do you have any tips and tricks for how to sort of finesse that so we sort of you, you kind of like apply online um it's not on ucas i don't think it's a ucas school anymore uh, anymore but um you sort of write a covering letter sort of but that's just like why i like acting what i want to do in terms of the industry and so everyone that applies you pay like i think at the time it was 40 pounds for me i don't know how much it is now i think they should be scrapped by the way the audition phase but um <laughs> and anyone who uh applies gets a first audition so your first audition sort of consists of you doing a classical monologue whether it's Marlowe or Shakespeare then you choose a contemporary speech um a short song which is unaccompanied and you do a, a piece of sight reading that you've never seen before just to see how you take to unseen material um what sort of characterization you bring to it and then um that's in front of people that are at the school teachers at the school or ex-students then if you're lucky enough you get a recall which is people that are in the same position as you and you do sort of like workshops with how to approach new speeches and things like that and, and interviews so yeah and after that you sort of wait and find out sounds like a very lengthy process <laughs> yeah um what were some of the sort of your best memories or best opportunities that you received because of drama school um i would say like in terms of I got to experience, I got to do plays that I, I never would have seen myself doing if I didn't go. Like mm -hmm. I never saw myself really as fitting into the classical theatre world or anything. Um, I'd, the only sort of experience I'd had with it before was I think a school trip to go to the, the Globe like in year nine or something. So that kind of, I was like, oh, I actually quite like Shakespeare. This is really cool. There's different ways of doing it. and you know, stage fighting, sword fighting, which is like, I never would have done that if it wasn't for drama school. And just sort of the experience I got in terms of touring, what I really liked about Bristol is they have a thing in your second year that you're not actually in the building at school. You're mostly out of it touring. So you do a nativity to school kids. Then in a the middle term, you do a, a bridge Shakespeare touring as well to school kids. And then you do a restoration um, to a fee paying audience so that's like a very vocational very hands-on sort of way of looking at it so yeah yeah sounds so cool mm. yeah. um it sounds like they really sort of put you through different um sort of expertises and pushed mm -hmm. you outside of your comfort zone especially with I, i'm guessing like things like sword fighting and stuff like yeah. that yeah what were some of the greatest challenges of, of drama school um i would say there's always a thing with when you make your hobby your job, like mm. it's, oh, I'm doing it for fun, or I, this is going to be how I earn the majority of my money. And with that comes a lot of, um, you kind of have to take it a lot more seriously than you did when you were a teenager just doing it on Saturdays. So a lot of that came from sort of sometimes the constructive criticism you'd get at drama school, which is to help you, but you're like, I'm not used to getting this in terms of acting in this way that is so personal and sometimes you're like, oh, okay. So, so that was sort of difficult for me to get into grips with. Like, it is fun, but also this is my job, so I've got to take this really seriously. Um, also, I would say, especially when it came to final year, one of the challenges was not comparing yourself to people, not comparing yourself to people in your year, especially when things start heating up in terms of agents, interest, all of that, and just staying on your own track and saying, this is a, it's challenging but this is what I have to do and just keep your head down and not compare and yeah that was a really interesting insight yeah definitely um in terms of securing an agent or um sort of working outside of drama school was that a possibility to work as well as learn um and how did you get an agent do you mean work as an actor or like a sort of any other job um, I think probably as an actor, were you able to act in other things as well as sort of Bristol projects? Um, I didn't. And 
most people there was a guy in my year that left in first year because he already had an agent and he got a job um but that was sort of an exceptional circumstance i think mm -hmm. most of us have come from worlds where we don't have agents we don't have those connections and i think if you're going to go to drama school at least for me i was like i just want to give it a hundred percent and not have any outside um distractions and just i'm here for three years and that's it and i will audition and everything when i leave so yeah no i didn't work and most people didn't Mm. And did the drama school help you get an agent? Or? Um, yeah, they did. They did. And just agents that I wouldn't have had access to and getting a showcase in London was because we're based in Bristol, but that was really um, useful. And yeah, that's how I got my agent because we'd met them in uh, sort of January, February in the final year at school. And then we did a, a showcase in London uh, mm. a bit after and yeah, I then signed off to that. Very cool. Um, and at drama school, did you only do theatre training or did you also do sort of screen, TV and film training? Um, it is sort of one of the drama schools that are, um, most drama schools actually, I would say in the UK are mainly theatre based. Mm. Um, so a lot of my training did come from theatre, like um, in the second year, like I said, like touring productions and things like that, uh, stage work. But we did some TV, we did some TV projects and classes, but it was uh, less frequent. And mm -hmm. I did hear from students that are there at the moment, things are sort of changing in terms of drama schools are seeing that the industry is a lot now, a lot of people going to TV and you're just as likely to get a, a job, like I said, on, on doctors than you are as a stage play. So you need to also have the same sort of um, experience in school in terms of that. So, but for me, when I was there, it was mainly theatre. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, to sort of come to your personal techniques and your approach to um, acting, what helps you to engage with a character? And do you have any kind of routine or method for sort of getting into character? Um, in terms of getting into character, I find if I've given if I've been given enough enough time, or if I've, I'm just about to start a job, um, what I like to do is like write about my character's backstory. That's not necessarily in between the scripts. Like make fill the gaps in. Like where do I come from? Where am I? What's my background? Um, what's my family like? What are my interests and everything? Um, so personally, for me, that is a kind of way to build on a character to make it more three dimensional than just lines off the page that you're saying. Um, I would also say like, <clears throat> in terms of like scene by scene, like what are my goals? What do I want to gain from this scene? So yeah, that kind of helps. And do you have a sort of pre-performance routine? like night by night kind of thing? Uh, not really. I'm not <laughs> one of those actors that um, some people are and some people aren't. And you have to sort of respect everyone's process as an actor. But I tend to go a, a, a bit quiet before I'm about to go on stage, but that's me just trying to like think through the lines of the first scene. I tend not to say, oh, and this is going to be my track for the whole show because I might be in the middle of the play and then we start and not be in the right place. I'm like, you know, just focus on the first scene and let the story, let the play just take you through. You already know it. You've done the work in rehearsal. So, yeah, I like to listen to music a bit, but that's a ritual. <laughs> yeah, it's a very cool and collected um, approach. Do you yeah. feel like you still get stage fright at all? Or have you sort of... Oh my God, I get nervous all the time. I get nervous every time I go on stage. I get nervous before an audition. I get nervous before interviews. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it never goes away, at least for me. But it's just learning how to like control it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for controlling it? Just whatever happens, happens. It's live. If you go wrong, you're not going to die. <laughs> um, just, <laughs> just do it. Like it's the people are paying to see it, and sometimes the mistakes are what people love the most about what they see. Things that go wrong, um, you, actually, and in effect, in a performance, you're not meant to be perfect. So, and if you are, then you're not being open. So, yeah. that really helps. Yeah, thank you. That's brilliant advice. Mm. Um, do you have any advice or how do you deal with getting rejected for a part? Uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I think with every part you get, especially the more you want something, the more it hurts. And mm. the closer you get to a part, 
the more recalls you have for a part, the more you start to envision you know, like your life, like, oh, I'm going for this TV show, it's going to change my career, like, and you start to imagine yourself having it, and that really hurts. And there's no really remedy for it. You just have to sort of say, look, like it's kind of out of my control. The most I can do is learn my lines, give my flavour to the character, work as hard as I can. And I think once you get into grips of knowing that you, you aren't in control, you're not the producer, you're not in control, and things can be so banal, like how you miss a job, you can be uh, too tall for the male lead, you could be, your hair could, um, I don't know, like someone else could match whoever they've already cast more than you can. So once you get into grips of knowing that you've got no self-control, that actually weirdly in a way helps you get more self-control because you're like, it's got nothing to do with me. So, yeah. yeah. No, so yeah, brilliant way to look at it. Yeah. Um, to come back to some of your uh, roles that you did last year, mm. you were performing at the Grosvenor Park Open Air Theatre. What were some of the differences between performing indoors and outdoors and, you know, some of the challenges of that? Um, I would say in a technical way, like in terms of vocally, um, you can always get it wrong in terms of giving too much volume and the audience can't hear what you're saying. And actually most of it with uh, uh, spaces like um, outside, which is dead air, which is actually quite difficult to play, is mainly about diction mm -hmm. as well as volume. So that's like a difference in terms of indoors. Also, um, there's not as much you can do outside than you can do indoors. Well, depending what theatre you are. But at, at the Grosvenor, there was very little lighting, very little sound. So that's like you've got to be as dynamic. You've got to act as if you have the Olivier National sound and uh, lighting team with you as well. So that that's a thing. And also in terms of being outside, you're not going to have rain <laughs> in <laughs> indoors. So that's a thing. Um, the natural elements, animals. Um, there was one time I was doing a speech and a pigeon completely upstaged me, like uh, eating a bread roll that first day had thrown on the floor. So that's like, you have to, um, you have to be on your toes more outside mm. because there's more, there's more going on. And if you don't react to that, you're not in the moment. So, and, and um, depending on where you are outside, we that uh, Grosvenor Park that space is in the round so it's a lot more intimate mm. and you can actually talk to people you can look at people engage in a conversation which takes bravery to start off with but that's really fun and has a big payoff so yeah amazing yeah thank mm. you um and just last question from me um mm. as well as through drama school have you had any older actors or directors who you felt some sort of like mentoring or advice that you've really learned from them mm. I wouldn't I would say no in terms of not out of choice it's just um not really I think most most of the people that are around me most of the people I mean varying ages but no one I would really say is a direct mentor sort of I would say like our, my friends we sort of influence each other some of I've worked more in classicals uh, my my best friends worked more in tv and film so in terms of help she helps me with self tapes that I may not be as pro as her and I, I can give uh, help with Shakespeare because I feel more confident in that. So no, I'd say that my friends that I've made along the way that I made at drama school more of sort of mentor each other in a way, but um, no, no direct older sort of person to guide me through, I guess. That group sounds really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of um, Shakespeare, you've played Viola and Ariel and they're, very well-known and big parts. Do you ever feel any pressure in taking on such a well-known role? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I, I would say it's um, really nerve-wracking, especially when people, you know, there are some Shakespeare's that aren't as well-known. Mm -hmm. And Twelfth Night, Tempest, are, you know, one of the ones that people know the most. And, like, everyone knows that I left No Ring with her speech. Everybody knows it. Everyone knows Judy Dench played it. And you have all of these amazing actresses that have done it in the past. So I would always get really nervous before that scene when we were doing the show to just to be like, oh, everyone's come to see, like, not that speech, but everyone knows it. Everyone is one of those things you can quote. So I, I kind of, like, was to myself, like, you can't, like, give everybody their version that they want. Mm -hmm. So you just have to do it your way. And just when you're just, when she's discovering things that happened 
to her through that just let it happen and mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do and also in terms of um aerial like it's such a, a an iconic part in a different way in terms of like it's this spirit it's this magical thing and people are expecting this being and i was always doing it in a small theater with without that cgi without the all of that that made me really nervous as to how am i meant to be not a human being and i am a human being but yeah i i kind of found it along the way but yeah it was nerve-wracking with parts as famous as those mm, yeah well as you were saying like having previous famous actors play these yeah. roles, did you find like how did you make the role your own did you ignore and like not watch the judy dench version or did you try mm. and adapt how they characterize yeah. I was very tempted to watch like that, but I was just like, do you know what? I think it's best if I just don't. I think it's best if I <laughs> stay away from it because even if it's just a, a tad unconsciously, I'm gonna take something away from it because I admire her and because I love her work and because Ben Wishaw is amazing as Ariel in the, in the uh, I watched it after, but you know, in the film version, so iconic, I was like, I, I'm just gonna stay away from it and just, make my own version without influence and mm. see what comes of that organically. Yeah, sounds like a, a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you have a, a sort of dream Shakespeare role that you would love to play? Mm. I think every actress wants to play Lady Macbeth at some point. I mean, mm. She's uh, like such an amazing character. Beatrice would be amazing as well. Like she's got such great, great words to say and a uh, female in a Shakespeare that's so witty and that like just as just as witty as the men as well that that's nice mm -hmm. but also in, in terms of a man like I'm not gonna because Jumbo I think Spain Hamlet well, was meant to play it this year so I'm like you mm -hmm. know I wouldn't say no to that because Mark Antony and Julius Caesar who knows whatever <laughs> I'd love to see that <laughs> <laughs> um and then sort of back to technique how do you make mm -hmm. these characters and with this sort of early modern Shakespearean language how do you make them feel relatable to a, a modern audience I think the main thing about um, feeling relatable is the audience feels as if you're speaking English the way we speak today. So I think a lot of it with me is um, making sure I know exactly what I'm saying, not just the gist of it, because you can get lazy and you can say, oh, my character's sort of angry. Yeah, I don't really know what this Shakespearean word is. But in terms of for me, I'm like every line gets translated in modern language every word I have uh, you know I know what I'm saying all the time mm. and just like just remembering as well that each of these characters yes it's Shakespearean yes the language is hundreds of years old but they also want something they also you know Viola falls in love with Orsino that happens in a in a modern play you know just treat it as if it were a modern play yes you're speaking mm. archaic language but it, you want things, you have aims, you have ambitions, so just follow those through. And as long as you know what you're saying, as long as you can understand what you're saying, I think I trust the audience will understand and follow and relate to it just as much as if it were written last year. Mm. In that respect, do you think you actually have a, a similar approach to how you sort of characterise for Shakespeare as well as modern contemporary plays? Um, I would say apart from all the work in terms of iambic and de dum de dum de dum like all of those things that you have to do i i would say yeah i think i i i would try to treat the the text as as how i would treat a, a modern play because i think it deserves that sort of respect in terms of um what don't get so cowed by the language and yeah i would say my my characterization wise language aside how i would treat Viola in terms of how i'm playing someone in a modern play will be the same. And lastly, do you have any, like, do you have a, a favorite role that you played or a favorite cast or ensemble that you, you've been a part of? Mm. I, I don't know, I feel like, I think because I've done Twelfth Night twice in sort of, sort of different viewpoints, I, I understudied it and then I got to play it as my own. I think I feel like, oh, I've, I've seen that character the most in terms of my career and I, I also got cast as Viola in first year at school so it's like three times so I feel like that's probably my favorite um character that I've played um did you say sorry what did you say oh, like a favorite ensemble that you've been a oh, part an ensemble of. Um, I've made really good friends with each each um ensemble that I've been with but I would say you know the RSC was really fun there's a difference between touring and being somewhere and I think that was 
may be there maybe on maybe the rsc because we got to go to the states and tour the uk so that's that just more of a bonding thing that went on there yeah very cool yeah that sounds amazing what, what was your favorite location that you performed at in the states um i would say bam in new york it's a really nice theater brooklyn's really cool um mixed audiences um yeah and i've always always wanted to do a play there so yeah that was my favorite for sure mm. and did you did you ever notice any kind of difference in reception between american and british responses uh, to shakespeare they're a lot louder <laughs> <laughs> they they they're more comfortable to express themselves if they like something um they they're more i don't know but but the on the other hand with the british audiences when they laugh i'm like i earned that like <laughs> never show any emotion or show a lot less emotion so i'm like okay that was a real laugh yeah, so, yeah i yeah. would say that's the difference <laughs> yeah, shakespeare's such an idol for us yeah players, so yeah that, that is a good good, mm. good notice um just to come back to uh television and, and film do you feel like there are more opportunities on screen than on stage or the other way around or hmm. That one's difficult to answer because I feel like uh, uh, out of school, I think the most opportunities I personally have gotten is from stage. Mm -hmm. But on a wider aspect, I feel that maybe there are more stories for people of my particular casting on screen and not screen here, screen in the US. So, yeah. What do you mean by that? Um, they're just more diverse. Um, I think this country still has a bit of a love affair with period dramas that I don't, that, that um, obviously people like, that look like me don't fit into that narrative statistically. Um, not that that's a, a, a bad thing, but it will be really nice to see um, sort of a variety of stories that are treated with the same regard and respect and is more widespread, so. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, with with your time working on Pennyworth, how different was that to your time in theatre? And what were some things that you learned from your time on set? Um, I don't know. The first thing I, I, I sort of saw was like, oh, TV has a lot more money, doesn't it? <laughs> but apart from that, um, the, there was a lot more crew. There's a lot more. It felt like there was a oh, wow. This is like a massive operation and sort of acting weirdly is like the icing on the cake. Because everything is like, okay, let's get the lighting, let's get the set, let's get the costume, ma hair, makeup, everything perfect. And then you come in and you're sort of expected to deliver. And that's, you've got the easy job as the actor. So mm -hmm. that, felt, that felt a bit different in terms of how theatre's like, okay, how are we organically going to, everything is about the acting, every, the actors are sort of the base rather than the icing on the cake. So I, it, I liked it because it was like, oh, we're part of a bigger thing. But also I like theatre in terms of, um, you know, that's the, the, the centre and then you work around that. So, yeah, it was different, but nice. Hmm. Going back to theatre, how do you feel like the, the industry has changed since you started out? Like, has it become more diverse or is it still sort of stuck in its, its old ways? Um, since 2016, I would say... I it mainly is the same I don't know but th there have been little bits that I'm like oh that's really exciting and um, uh, Roy, uh, Roy Alexander Wise I think how you say, say his name and, and Bryony um, Shanahan being made the um, our joint artistic directors of the exchange I was like oh that is so exciting I'm so excited to see what they're going to produce and mm. you know the young Vic and Kwame and things that have been coming out of there but um, I, I, I would say more or less the same but there there is things happening so mm. how, how do you think it the theater or the sort of creative industries can improve in issues of diversity and representation i think i think that as well as having people of color on stage you have to have people behind the stage i think you've got to have people on the teams you've got to have people having a say in calling the shots as well. You've got to have working class people, women, people of colour, in order to have a diverse viewpoint of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a big thing. And even though I said having more people of colour on stage, it's like, but as well as casting the people of colour on stage, 
what roles are they playing what are you saying what are, what just because the role doesn't have to only call for a bane person like it shouldn't be a role that oh you got that part because we are set in america in the south and it's about african americans you, you, you can cast in a more uh open-minded way you can just say whoever get who's whoever is right for the part is going to get the part regardless of what you look like mm. whether you're a woman or a man or a white or you know asian black whatever but um yeah don't cast tokens and i think i don't know just put more interesting stuff let's see writers that aren't established let's see i love shakespeare i think shakespeare is great but i think maybe for every shakespeare uh, Shakespeare pay you do maybe say that we're going to do two modern plays with someone you haven't heard before mm. so yeah yeah that's a that's an amazing plan I would like to see <laughs> that in the theatre now yeah. <laughs> um and sort of on a bit of a sadder note what do you think the the future of theatre will hold in a post-corona world and do you think it's being adequately supported I don't know I'm, I'm I have no answer to that I'm very interested to see and you know from from what i'm i'm seeing and seeing especially i think southampton is the one that closed um mm. and and that's just a bit i don't know i don't, and i don't know who's going to be left i don't know if the people that are left are the people that are the ones that are mostly the ones that have the most power if you know what i mean the rich ones that are able to hold out and everything so that makes me nervous in terms of are we going to have a less diverse pool of people around after covid um but i don't know in terms of the role of theater i hope that they recover and i hope that things only move forward and not regressively in terms of the progress that we have been making um did you say what what were the the government doing yeah or well, do you think theater and the arts are being supported enough oh no mm. yeah no oh uh, but i think uh there was something I saw on Twitter that it showed a list of each country and how much they'd given in terms of arts funding to theatres and UK had nothing. Yeah. Which doesn't make any sense because the arts puts more money into things like football. Yeah. For sure. Like we make more money than football and it's not just people coming to the theatre and tickets that you're losing money out on. It's the TFL are going to lose travel, the bars that people drink after the shows, the food that people buy on the way to the show and at the show, you know, it doesn't even make any economic sense. And yeah. Even whether you like theatre or not, it doesn't make any economic sense mm -hmm. to not invest in something that makes your country so much money. So I do not understand what's going on there. No, it's very silly. Um, have you found that the sort of theatrical process has adapted to this new lockdown world? Like, have you had any rehearsals over zoom or like you were talking about tapes beforehand mm. um yeah i think what from what i've seen in terms of a theater actor it's like oh i'm getting more self tapes in terms of like i said obviously theaters aren't looking to open until next year so most castings are for tv and film who have been granted the permission to go ahead as long as they're socially distanced which is easier to do than it is in the theater um but in terms of theatre adapting, I'm seeing a lot of theatres try, you know, keeping everyone engaged, doing, I think I did a Zoom thing with, uh, with German Street last week where we were talking about the play in a podcast just to keep everybody engaged and having pub quiz nights and fundraisers. And so I think they are doing their best with, with what they can. Mm. Um, and yeah, doing play readings and things like that making the most of the situation. Mm. Um, lastly, do you have any projects in the pipeline that you can possibly tell us about? Um, not particularly. I would say I'm doing a, like I said, a sort of play thing on Zoom. So that'll be in interesting. I've never done that. But um, auditioning on self tapes. And then obviously when theatre opens, I was only a week into playing Ariel. So when theatre's open again, that's what the theatre's going to open with. So mm. yeah, it's something to look forward to, but we'll see. That would be yeah, such an interesting thing to sort of just like press resume on something. Exactly. Really. After like eight months, it would be crazy. Yeah. But yeah. Crazy. But um, thank you so much for all of those answers. We're going to open up um the Q and A to the, our guests um in yeah for the last ten minutes. But just while we're waiting, so if everyone could just type in any questions they have on the Q and A. 
do you have any TV or film or even theatre recommendations to fill our lockdown summers? Um, what have I been watching? Dark on Netflix, if you like a bit of a mind bender. It's like a German supernatural sort of show. Um, I May Destroy You, mm-hmm. Michaela Cole. I'm loving that at the moment. So, so good. Um, I think everyone's watched Normal People. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, what else have I been watching? I've got things on my list. I would say, yeah, it, I May Destroy You is what I've been watching at the moment. I've, I literally just binged watched it in two days because um, I think I, I was eight episodes in, so that's what I've been watching. But mm. It's incredible. Also seeing an actor who can write as well as they can act is something to be marvelled at. Yeah. <laughs> She's amazing. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. What about you guys? What yeah, you- I binged. I binged. I made a story you in like not even two days and mm. one evening. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, that was great. Um, and then rewatched Scarface with my sister who had never seen it oh, yeah. on Netflix, and that's really mm-hmm. good. That's very good. Yeah, I watched the new Spike Lee film on Netflix. That was really good as well. Oh, what's the name of that again? Oh. The, the Five Bloods. Oh yeah. yeah. Really good. Yeah. Very scary. Yeah. <laughs> but really, really good. That's I love exciting. love his style. Yeah. We have our, our first question for you is from an anonymous attendee. But they asked, How did you choose your drama school and where would you recommend for someone who wants to go into film? Into film. Um well, I chose my drama school like like I said, in terms of the, the second year, that really appealed to me, that touring year. I was like, wow, like that to have something so vocational and hands-on, I was like, I really want to go here. And I, I would say go, and I don't know how it's going to work in terms of COVID and if you're planning on auditioning next year, but visit the school. You will get a feel in the physical feel of the school. I knew Bristol was where I wanted to go from just being there at the first audition. I don't think, think they do open days, but visit the school read about the perspective obviously you like film so you already sort of know where you want to go which is good um I would say who who does film uh, I think arts ed have a good tv and film department and maybe uh from what I've heard Aura the uh the yeah recorded arts I can't remember what they're uh, called in full but I, I've heard that their tv department is uh, strong cool thank you Thanks. We've got another question here from an anonymous mm-hmm. attendee who asks about um, understudying and asks, mm-hmm. what are some of the challenges of being fully prepared to go on stage and perform a role? And were there any instances where you did have to fill in for someone who you're understudying for? Yeah, so um, so I've done it twice. Um, so it, it, it's, diff- it's a good, difficult job. And actually, after doing it, it I, I have a massive respect for people who understudy and they're also in the show because not only do you have to know what you're doing in your track, you have to learn somebody else's lines and somebody else's stage directions and props and what they use and be able to fit in and into the production should you need to. Um, so that is a challenge. And it's also a challenge to try and give your own perspective to the character, but not too much in terms of throwing off the other actors Mm. when you go in for that person um I did have to go on once which was my first the first one I did the one at the national and um that was a challenge as in I found out I had to do that I think at the half or just before the half about five something um and yeah that that that's a challenge because I in a way it's more nerve-wracking than having to do it every night because it's not something you're used to so yeah you always have to be on your toes and ready very impressive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've got another question which asks, is there any project that you have always wanted to be a part of? Any specific project? Mm. Like a, a favourite <sighs> play you've studied at drama school? Or play I've studied at school. Um, gosh, that's hard. Sorry. No Why is this the hardest question? Um, <laughs> I, d- I wouldn't say that for me there's a, like a specific play that I was like I have to do this play sorry if I didn't answer that but I would say um I've always wanted to do some tv in the states if that answers your question in terms of but yeah 
no specific thing that I'm like, I have to do this play. Maybe I'll find one, who knows? Yeah. We've got a great question here, um, which mm. asks, if you weren't an actor, which member of crew would you like to be? Oh, uh, I would be a terrible stage manager because I lack organisational skills. I would probably, lighting seems cool. They all seem to be having a good time. And it seems, um, yeah, they always know their shit as well. Probably lighting. Thank you. Um, lastly, do you ever find acting emotionally taxing or draining? And if so, can you think of any particular mo moments or sort of ways to combat it? Um, this one's quite a, a difficult question. Actually, in terms of, I would say the bits in between acting, as I don't know if this is answering your question, but actually the bits in between when you're not acting is the hardest because it's like, what do I do in between and not getting jobs and not booking the things and that can be taxing to your mental health. But I don't know if you meant in terms of acting in terms of the actual craft. Uh, yeah, maybe, but... Yeah. Maybe. Um, taxing or draining? No. I, I don't know, not particularly. I think I've not had that part yet since I've left school, that part to ask so much of me mm. in terms of that. And I think I would try to separate. Um, um, I'll try to separate myself from the character in terms of I, I don't want it to impact my mental health so much that I have to, you know, seek therapy afterwards because it is my job and I need to stay healthy and I wouldn't really say that I'm a method actor or take that sort of stance to it. So I personally haven't had that experience yet. And I, I would probably try to avoid that. Getting there. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, completely fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's probably all that we have time for. But thank you so much, Whitney, for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time. And thank you to everyone who joined this call and asked such brilliant questions. Yeah, Great. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Um, and to everyone else, please, can you like our Facebook page for more updates and register for our next Q&A with actor Hattie Morahan on Monday, July the 6th at 6.30pm. And thank you so, so much, Whitney. We really appreciate no, you. Thank you for having me. It was really fun.